Hello and welcome back. Um, so, the Obers program and Godel's incompleteness theorem. I've kind of set a big expectation for this video. Let's see how it goes. Uh, let's begin by, by looking back over what we know about Hilbert so far. Um, we started looking at Hilbert's foundations of geometry. Uh, he, one of the things he showcased was the sort of reinterpretability of our words and different models of what our axioms could be talking about. And using this to show, for example, that the parallel postulate is independent of the other four axioms of Euclidean geometry. Uh, but it had even more uses there. Uh, for example, uh, the way I put it was one proof could prove uh, many truths. So for example, uh, in Euclid's geometry, he proved that every line segment had a unique midpoint using only the first four axioms. And therefore, that's true in any model that also satisfies those first four axioms. So for example, that proof also holds for the Beltrami-Klein model of a circle with chords in it, or a Poincaré model of circles with you know, circular arcs in it, and stuff like that. One proof can yield multiple truths. And he saw that as the real strength of his method. Uh, then in his debate, we saw that this perspective kind of committed him to the view that uh, logical relationships held just between symbol strings. Frege thought logical relationships held between the thoughts we had when we we're like reading these strings. But for Hilbert, it had to be between these symbol strings because if we can show things about these logical relations independent of how we're interpreting our words, what we mean by them, then it must just hold between those symbol strings themselves. Um, now, Frege, as we saw in the last video, then developed this symbolic logic. Uh, he algebraified, if you will, uh, reasoning. And, and this, in fact, helped Hilbert's cause because God knows I have students that do lots and lots of algebraic manipulation without necessarily knowing what it is they're doing. And if you can do this with logical reasoning, then maybe Hilbert had something there. All right, so Frege didn't intend it to sort of further Hilbert's goals, but it definitely seemed to do that. Now, just because Hilbert says logical relationships hold between meaningless symbol strings doesn't mean that he thought mathematics was just a game of meaningless symbol strings, which is how some people have interpreted them. Hilbert held that there were sort of two parts of mathematics. There was the meaningful stuff, which is all the finitary stuff the stuff that you can actually imagine. And then there's what he called the ideal mathematics, which is all this infinitary stuff, the stuff that you really can't maybe picture in your head, but we can reason about, reason about logically. Um, Hilbert did his undergrad work in Königsberg, which is the same university Kant was from about a hundred years after Kant. And uh, it had a big impression on him. And in this meaningful part of mathematics, he was a big Kantian. He believed that finitary stuff that we can actually imagine uh, is all rooted in our manifold or intuitions of space and time and all of that stuff. Um, but the reasoning, using sentences and reasoning without having any thought about what we're reasoning about is exactly one of those things that Kant said you shouldn't do. Remember, Kant's critique of pure reason, he tried to come up with sort of a set of laws uh, which would then organize um, philosophy like an organized society that uh, operates by the rule of law. And one of those things he said that you cannot do if you're going to reason correctly is reason without really understanding or having a thought behind what it is you're reasoning about. Hilbert, being a practicing mathematician, which means I assume he graded lots of algebra homework, um, wanted all of this infinitary stuff because it was an extremely powerful tool. So he broke from Kant and saying, no, 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 you can do this as long as you can certify it's safe, as long as you can certify it's consistent. Uh, he was a real big believer of this infinitary stuff. He said that to uh, uh, deny mathematicians the use of infinity is like denying the boxer the use of his fists. Or he said, no one will ever expel us from the paradise that Cantor had created for us. So he was a big enthusiastic uh, uh, fan of all of this stuff. He just needed to certify it was safe. And this was a very real, problem. Remember, at this point in time, we're coming out of the, the collapse of infinitary calculus. We're coming out of uh, inconsistencies in Frege's logical axiom system, inconsistencies in Cantor's naive set theory. Uh, this is something really in the air. So he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know that this has gone wrong before and that Kant argues against it, but as long as we can certify it's okay somehow, that's good. That's good enough. Then we can use it. All right. 
how can we prove that this axiom system is consistent? I mean, so far all that's happened is people kept operating until they found a consistency. How can we prove that there will never be an inconsistency coming out of it? Well, I'm going to illustrate uh, a way to do this uh, by sharing a puzzle with you. And uh, so how we do this is kind of captured in this puzzle. So let's play a game, let's have a puzzle here. And let's say we start with a simple string, mi, and we have three rules for getting new symbol strings from old symbol strings. Uh, given m followed by some st string of symbols, that x just represents some string of symbols, we can double it, so xx. So for example, if we had like m i u i, we could make that m i u i i u i. We double the symbol string after the m. So this is rule one. Uh, rule two is if we have anywhere three i's in a row, so anything, three i's, anything, we can replace it with a u and convert it to a u, okay? So for example, if we had m, i, u, i, 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 let's say we can make that m, i, u, u, converting these three i's in a row to a u. And lastly, if we ever have two u's next to each other, we can eliminate them, we can drop them. So for example, this M I U U, we can just convert to M I again. All right, those are our three rules. So from this, we can start doing a lot of stuff. Uh, double, double again, convert those three to a U, maybe double again and double again and so forth, and get new symbol strings. The puzzle is this using M I, starting with M I, and using these three rules, can we reason to M U? Can we get to M U? Uh, you can pause the video, think about it a bit, try it a bit, play with it a bit. Uh, don't spend too much time on this or else you'll hate me. Uh, but, but definitely get a feel for the puzzle. All right, I'm going to assume you gave it a good try and you're back now. And I'm going to tell you that actually, no, you cannot reach MU. And now how can we see this? Well, the way I think of it, this is my interpretation, is let's think of I and U as like coins. Like I is a penny, one cent, and then U is a three cent piece. And let's take a look at the value of our symbol strings. So mi, we start with a value of one cent. Uh, the first rule doubles our value, okay? In particular, here's the important part, uh, this is the very first thing we have to do and it immediately gets us to an even number value for our symbol string. The second rule here leaves the value the same. Uh, it just converts three cents into a three cent piece. So it doesn't, uh, change the value at all. And this third one subtracts six cents. Now, here's something else. If you have an even value and you're subtracting six cents from it, you will still have an even value. So because the only first move we can make is going from MI to MII, we're going to go to an even value. None of our rules anymore gets us out of that even value. Every symbol string we can get from MI, except for MI itself, will have an even value to it. And MU in this system is worth three cents. So we cannot get to MU from MI. The important thing here is we just start with some meaningless symbol string, MI, it doesn't really mean anything. We have three rules of getting new symbol strings from old ones. And by analyzing them mathematically, we can show what kinds of symbol strings we can and cannot get with these rules. Okay, so this is the kind of process we have. Now let's take uh, axiomatic set theory. So zermelo frankel set theory, um, leave out the axiom of choice for now. Uh, this set theory, the axioms can be encoded in symbolic logic. So let me get that up for you here. So here you go. These are the axioms of set theory in symbolic logic. Now, I'm gonna ask the perhaps the easiest thing I have asked of you in this entire lecture series. And that is, I don't want you to understand what these mean, but rather I just want you to view these as meaningless symbol strings like MI and MU and so on. Okay, so take a look at them. Meaningless symbol strings, check, got, done, easy, good. All right, now there's laws of logic for getting new symbol strings from old ones. And these are mechanical laws, just like the three laws in the MU puzzle we had. What Hilbert wanted to do was do an analysis just like on the MU puzzle, but on this, using these symbol strings and the laws of logic, characterize what kinds of strings we can and can't get from this and prove 
that we can't get a contradiction, a symbol string and its negation. And this is Hilbert's vision. He called this branch of mathematics, this branch of investigation, he called metamathematics. And this is how he foresaw we could cash out certifying the consistency of the infinitary part of mathematics. And that was Hilbert's program. Okay, good. So, how'd it go? Well, in 1931, a man by the name of Kurt Gödel came up with a result we call Gödel's incompleteness theorem. The way I think of it is this. So think of these symbol strings and the rules of getting new ones from old ones as like a computer program. And think of Gödel as like a hacker. What Gödel did was this. Given a set of axioms, a starting set of symbol strings, and assuming that they are consistent, he gave a recipe for cooking up a new symbol string that uh, you can neither get it nor its negation from your axiom set. That means that this is independent of your original axiom set. You can either prove nor disprove it. Uh, this, this is like something, if you want to believe it, you need to add it in as a new axiom. Now, remember, uh, Euclid had five axioms and over two millennia, people found a bunch of others uh, that he really needed. And so Hilbert came out with his foundations of geometry and um, it had 20 axioms in it. Well, what question we never asked was, is that enough? Is that all? I mean, that's great, but are there more that we're missing? And what Goodall's incompleteness theorem showed that in this system, symbolic axioms, this uh, a, a mechanical process of reasoning, as long as your axioms could encode a certain amount of arithmetic, as long as it can code enough arithmetic, it will always be incomplete. You will always need a new statement. There will always be something it can't decide. <clears throat> okay, well, that's kind of disappointing. But there's a second incompleteness theorem. This is sort of a one-two punch. And this second incompleteness theorem is the one that really knocks it out. What is that statement that Goodall cooked up that you can either prove nor disprove from those axioms? It's the statement that those axioms are consistent. That is, the consistency of the axioms is one of those things you can neither prove nor disprove from the axioms itself. So let's take a look at what the result is here. First of all, as long as you have an axiom set that encodes enough arithmetic, which you, which you want, which if you're going to come up with a system of mathematics, you want arithmetic in it, right? One, it's never enough. There will always be statements you can cook up that your axioms don't decide. You're always going to need new axioms. And two, one of the things that it can't do is prove its own consistency. So you can never be certain that something like the collapse of the infinitesimal calculus or the inconsistency in Frege's system or the inconsistency in Cantor's naive set theory will ever happen. You can never certify that that won't happen. Ugh. Wait a minute. That doesn't sound like a happy ending. Whoopsie. I guess it really is real life after all. <clears throat> so what's the legacy of Hilbert's program? On one hand, at this point, mathematicians have stopped caring, so don't worry about it. That puts the legacy of Hilbert's program in the hands of philosophers. And the good news is, as I've said many times before in this series, philosophers never agree on anything. And so that gives us some wiggle room. All right. But despite that, um, they probably came as close as they ever have to agreeing on something in the decades after Gödel's incompleteness theorem uh, in saying that it really killed Hilbert's program. However, my old advisor, Mick, would say, not so fast. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, why not? What's going on there? Well, to start, saying that this killed Hilbert's program is in a way kind of lazy reasoning. Despite the way I, that I presented things, Hilbert never really committed himself to a particular system, to zermelo frankel set theory, or even Principia Mathematica, or even uh, Frege's symbolic reasoning and the rules of that logic. And so just to say that this result about Frankel, uh, zermelo frankel set theory or whatever and using sort of Frege's symbolic logic and so forth is at best lazy reasoning. You need to sort of make an argument that Hilbert's program is still uh, uh, not possible. Um, you still have to make that argument that no way of cashing out Hilbert's program is possible. 
So let's take a look at what his, his vision, what his vision of how mathematics worked was this. We had some finitary meaningful part a la Kant. And then we had this really useful infinitary part that mathematicians used all the time. And all we had to do was certify that that was safe. And there's no real reason to think that that is not possible. We had one really promising and hopeful way of cashing that out. And Gödel's incompleteness theorem definitely put an end to that. But it doesn't mean that his vision is impossible and uh, couldn't cash out. So have philosophers since then tried to accomplish Hilbert's program? Well, um, philosophy, like mathematics, honestly, like science, like you know, biology and all that, operates in fads. And although there have been, for example, in my time, a fad of trying to uh, rehabilitate and fix up Frege's system, it really hasn't caught on to try to rehabilitate or fix up Hilbert's program. Uh, you might say, well, why didn't Mick do that if that was his thing? Well, believe me, he had his hands full convincing people that it wasn't dead already, that it wasn't impossible. So you might say, well, then maybe it's uh, the responsibility of his, his students to pick up the program. Oh, yeah, right. Whoopsie. Uh, moving right along. Uh, well, this is not the end of the road in philosophy of mathematics, but it is the last stop on this particular bus tour. As I said earlier, we did it. Next video is, it's called summary, but it's really, I think of it more as a wrap party. It's a, uh, a reward for making it through all of this for you and for me. As I said, I give you permission to bring some sort of treat to that video, ice cream, coffee drink, you know, adult beverage if you're of age. I will bring a treat myself. We will kick back. It'll be a little less formal than even this kitchen table discussion was. Uh, I'll tell you my very amateurish and uninformed understanding of what's happened since Gödel's incompleteness theorem. I'll tell stories about my experiences in graduate school in both mathematics and philosophy and wrap it up with really in the end, my belief is why knowing the history and philosophy of mathematics is really important uh, to being a mathematician. Well, we made it. <laughs> We're, we've finished the actual work and all that's left is the uh, celebration of the work. Thank you so much for joining me through all of this and I really look forward to celebrating with you at the end of it all.